The following presentation was recorded at the 2014 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2014 for helping make these videos possible. Thank you for coming to Coder, Non-Coders Wanted. Your guest speaker is Deb Nicholson. She's Community Outreach Director at the Open Invention Network and Community Manager at GNU Media Goblin. Cool. Thanks a lot. Um, so for this talk, I'm going to talk uh, to both non-coders who have been hanging around and are like, I wonder what else I could be doing um, besides learning to code, in case someone already mentioned that you might want to do that. Um, you don't have to do that. Oh, it's also for folks who have a coding project and suspect that there are some things that could be done by non-coders around their project. Um, uh, so I, I don't know if anyone here is at a project where they feel like they have too many volunteers already doing too much. Okay, great. So you're in the right place. Um, so uh, kind of the first question we get, because like, yes, code is important for a code project, sure, of course, but why do you need non-coders? For me, I think, uh, you, you think about, well, we have a lot of the coders here already. Um, when you go and you, you speak with folks about, uh, about free software, about using Linux, uh, they're already aware <laughs> that we're here. So um, in order for more people to be using Linux, we need to be reaching beyond that uh, little bubble of folks that are like, oh yeah, I, I already hack on the kernel. Like, uh, that's just not going to be enough people. If you think about like Windows being at like 90 some percent of the desktop, like uh, we, have to, we have to get in there and, and bring those folks uh, over so that they can come spend the weekend with us in Charlotte. So um, I also think that having like kind of a, a diversity of ideas and thoughts, just, it just makes better ideas, better solutions. Um, You've, I'm sure everyone here has had that uh, experience where they're tootling along doing something and someone else comes in and is like, huh, why'd you decide to do it all backwards? And you're like, uh. And so having a couple people to look at stuff, I mean, that's sort of how all of the, the whole thing with the open source works is having lots and lots of people looking at that source code. Um, but I think it, it works also for projects in general, like not just having multiple folks coming from the same discipline, but multiple folks coming from all over the place. Um, so for instance, when uh, I, I met some of the folks from the Twisted project at the Boston Python meetup, and, uh, and I asked Glyph, who's one of the project leads there, like, so what's Twisted do? And he said, oh, it says on the website. And I'm like, oh, it does. Okay, great, I'll look it up. Um, cause we're at a hack fest, so everyone's got their computer open. And I, and I go to the Twisted site, and they have like a list of components that are part of Twisted. And I said, yeah, the, the, so there's like a list of components, and they all have these weird names like Tornado and some acronyms. And, and he's like, yeah, that's what Twisted is. And I'm like, but I don't know what any of those mean. And then he's like, um, well, maybe, maybe our project's for people who already know they need it. And I'm like, so they like, they like enter this earth like through the birth canal like uh, and then it's only a matter of time before they come find twisted because they're going to grow up to be a sysadmin I'm like I, I, I don't know maybe you're not getting the most out of your website there so uh, and he didn't realize that because for him all of those words like the the components of twisted meant things for me uh being new to it i was like those those don't mean what you think they mean so uh, so perspective for outside of like your your regular beat. Um, here's some of the things that coders, uh, non-coders like to do. Um, I work at the Open Invention Network, so we we help folks with legal stuff like sorting out patent risk and ameliorating that. Um, but you know, we also can use folks to stuff envelopes, uh, to proofread, to document, to fundraise. I don't know if you have a project that has too much money. Um, I can help you with that. But if you have a project that does not have too much money, you might need someone to help you raise some money. Uh, that's one of the things that I help Media Goblin with. Um, you know, testing and data testing and doing QA. Um, uh, you know, all of these different types of things. Like, you don't need to know how to code to do any of them. And in fact, like, 
it would be hard to find time to do a significant amount of documentation and translation as well as a significant amount of code. So, uh, so these are just some of the things. And then these are pictures of people, you know, actually doing those things. Do you have to be able to code to dress up as a fox? Probably not. Um, but so, you know, so these are all like places where we can, uh, we can use non-coders. So for freedom, to build the free software movement, we have to get more folks. And, and a little bit better marketing and, and maybe some nicer websites and money wouldn't hurt. So uh, the reason I'm giving this talk is because I originally started out as a non-coder that organized other non-coders. So I did local political work in Massachusetts where I live. Um, so I learned all of this, like how you work with volunteers and how you get people to come back again as opposed to grumble about that grumpy lady that made me stuff all the envelopes and all that type of thing. Uh, so I got a job at the Free Software Foundation and then I was a non-coder organizing coders, like getting them to show up at booths and talk about the GNU project and things like that. So eventually, uh, you know, before I had gotten a job at the FSF, I had thought like coders, wow, they're like magic they read this all these special symbols like and and there's like you know I had looked at some of the some of the projects like I was looking at software for the licensing stuff and I was like man there's just pages and pages like yeah they must pretty much be magic and then I you know you eat lunch with people and you see someone with like spaghettios and you're like sort of the magic like ooh, like like, you're smart, but you're a real person. Okay, so then I thought, well, maybe I could learn to code. Um, not because I don't spill SpaghettiOs. I, I definitely do. They're messy to eat. But, um, so I thought, I'll go and I'll learn to code. So then I started working with OpenHatch after I learned to code to, um, to help folks uh, learn to code for the first time as well. So I learned, I learned enough Python to teach other people how to start on Python. Um, so, you know, then we're, we're kind of like completing the circle, except that uh, we don't really have coders doing such a great job of reaching out to non-coders yet. And you can see that that seems so sad. That seems wants to come and do documentation and raise money for you and, and maybe put on a GNU costume. So, um, so where are we going to find that seat? Uh, you know, it's a, uh, some, sometimes you might not know what you aren't good at. Like, um, this is one of those examples, like, so maybe you've been, you know, kind of muddling along without non-coders and you've been doing your own marketing, your own website. Um, I saw the folks from the Software Freedom Law Center at an event where uh, they're lawyers and they have, lawyers have something in common with coders in this way where they're like, well, I'm really smart and I went to school for a while and people tell me I'm smart, so I'm probably good at most things. So they had uh, gotten a booth for the first time and they had this box, which on the side of it, it said Kinko's. And so like, as you roll up on their booth, it looks like they're tabling for Kinko's. And, but I knew them, and I'm like, you guys working at Kinko's now? And they're like, what are you talking about? I'm like, no, we made these flyers. And I'm like, and you brought them right over and didn't even take them out of the box. And they're like, oh, I guess we should take them out of the box. So they take them out of the box, and it's this, uh, it's, it's legal paper, haha, because they're lawyers. Um, and it's all like one page, like dense, with the margins pushed all the way out to the edge. No images, no font differentiation. And then you flip it over and it goes about a third or a quarter down the back on the other side. Um, and didn't have any contact info. So I was like, <laughs> and I'm like, well, it's cool that you guys decided to start telling people about your work, but um, yeah, I mean, you live in New York City. There must be a person that owes you a favor. You're lawyers, for God's sakes that can help you make a flyer that is, that is better. So, so even, you know, and I'm not saying don't try new things. Like you can, you, can be, you can be a hacker that whips up a mean souffle, that's great. But like, if there's something that you, you're like, well, there's no one else to do it, before you jump in, maybe, maybe check and see if it's someone else's uh, thing that they're good at. Uh, so getting these people, who knows what you need? It might not be you. So I recommend like maybe if you have a project, you're like, man, I wish that we could be more like Debian or um, whatever it is. Like maybe it's Media Goblin, I don't know. But uh, once you figure out, oops, there goes that soda. Don't open that one for a while. Um, but once you figure out what that project you would like your project to be more like, figure out how they're doing it. I would even say take them to lunch and be like, 
how do you guys get so many interns? Or why does your website look amazing? Um, whatever that is, like go ahead and, and you know, figure out where they got that bone and maybe you can replicate it for yourself. Um, you also want to make it really easy for people to find you. Uh, so the, the website, like the Twisted website I was talking about, that's n no one knows unless they have already met you and spoken to you at length that, that they have finally found the right place. Like, oh, this is that like, project. What does it do? I don't know. Um, and then also make it easy for people to get started. So if, you, uh, if you've got, like maybe you know you need translation, like set up trans effects and put it on the front page. Mention it in your blog post. Like, you know, like, oh, we're, we're really grateful for our translators. And if anyone wants to help us with Italian and German and Russian, like, you know, please let us know. So you're like specific and you're saying exactly what it is you need. And then it's not, then when someone shows up, you're not like, um, shoot, the stuff I need you to translate, I, it's around here somewhere. Could you just hold on for like two weeks? Not the best. So you want to make it, like once you figure out what you need, like put it out there. You might have to do some documentation yourself uh, and just make it easy for folks to get started. Uh, if this is your website, not so great. You might need a website designer. Um, so, uh, you know, and, and finding a website designer, that's like one of those jobs where people, they want to have something to put on their resume. So like, you know, you might get someone's first website. It might look a little fun, maybe wild, like shiny, but it'll, it'll still look better than that other one up there. So, um, mm. so non-coders, I think, they're kind of the same as coders in some ways, in that they want to put stuff on their resume, uh, they want to meet new people, they want to learn new things, you know, they, they want to get stuff done, they want to, you know, maybe like do something nice for the world, like feed puppies, help orphans, all those kinds of things. Like they're, they're regular people like you and me. Um, but they're also a little bit different. So like, the thing that maybe excites a coder about their project is like, ooh, we're using this brand new NoSQL database that no one's even heard of. You tell your potential non-coder volunteer about that, and then you're like, plus we're gonna, you know, we're gonna do it with this like mashup of Haskell and Python. It's gonna blow your mind. They're like, what does it, what does it do? I don't even, you know, so you're talking about how it does what it does. But if you say, to a non-coder, like, oh, it helps doctors and patients communicate more effectively. Or it helps independent musicians get their music out there without having to be yoked to a major label. Or, um, you know, it helps people share uh, pictures of cats around the world. Even, you know, at least that's the what it does and not the how it does it. So I would suggest when you're, you're crafting your, your ask, like, hey, can you come do a bunch of free work for us non-coder that you maybe keep the no SQL part to yourself. Everyone clear on that one? Yes, fantastic. So uh, you also want to try and speak a person's language. My friend Molly made this slide. Sometimes I give this talk with her. Um, we both like Ryan Gosling. Um, <laughs> he's nice. Plus here he is chatting you know, about, uh, about web, web stuff. Um, but some of the things about language, like where, um, if, you, if you're like, I want a person to website, like, do you need a designer or do you need like a builder? So you kind of got to figure out the language in the area enough to get the right person. Um, one of the things that I, uh, when I started uh, doing free software stuff, a lot of my background is in fundraising, which we call development in the nonprofit sector. So people are like, oh, so you're working at the FSF now? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, they hired me because I've been doing development for like 15 years. And they're like, oh. And then I would get this stream of words and I was like, mm, yeah, none of those are about money or memberships. I don't like, yeah. And then it looked kind of like, oh, I said development. I gave you this, like, I gave you the wrong cue. Um, so, it, you know, and, and it can be the same here. So you, you kind of want to look around and find out what the lingo is enough to, articulate your needs. Um, so actually finding them once, you, once you've gotten ready, you've figured out like what you need, who you need, what you're gonna call them, um, your user base is a great place to start. Uh, people don't really come from nowhere. This is, 
this is not a scientific graph. This is just kind of how I imagine like people coming into the core of your project. Um, you're not really going to get people who haven't heard of your project submitting bugs. Like, how would they find you, right? So uh, if you kind of imagine this uh, this model of people coming in, or you can you can picture it like this. Like these X's are people that are not going to contribute to your project. Um, so like users and then people who recommend your software and then folks that file bugs. So you want to make it really easy. Like this is similar to the, um, the funnel that they talk about on like a sales website. Like you have lots of people that skip by and have like a, a, like a marginal amount of involvement and then you want to get them all the way down to the end. So for our purposes, the, the sale is to get them to become a contributor to our project, right? Um, so one of the things that you might kind of want to ponder here is like, are there any barriers along this path? So you may have something here where like actually your, your regular like lovely gooey facing uh, website doesn't make any mention of your bug stuff. So like someone might be like, I found a bug. I went to the website, it just had a download link, so I just kept the bug to myself and never shared it. Um, so that, that's just like one example of like what's keeping people from coming from the, the general use and recommendation population into the contributing, bug filing, uh, maybe fundraising, legal advice part. So um, another place that you can look for non-coders is friends of friends of friends. Um, we had, uh, we had someone who translated stuff into Arabic for us at Media Goblin. And then, you know, we were like, wow, so you're, you're really great at this. We didn't even, you know, we had just put it out there like not that long ago. Do you know anyone else? And he's like, oh yeah, I know an Italian guy. I know someone who does Portuguese, you know. And so all of a sudden we had like 17 languages in a project that's still beta. <laughs> so not too shabby. Um, you know, and it makes it easier for us to get other contributors of all types in those languages as well. Uh, schools, um, maybe not in high schools, but in other types of schools, I hear people go there because they like learning. Um, some folks are probably in high school because they like learning. I know I, I liked learning. I didn't like high school though. Uh, it's probably not as, as rare as I think. Um, but schools are a really great place because people want to learn new things. Uh, you might also be able to get folks to do something like an internship. One thing about uh, internships is that they're not, um, they're not the pick up my dry cleaning, like take my car to get wax kind of thing. And in fact, in some places, it's illegal to have interns do that for you. So like not only is it not a good idea because it doesn't make people excited to recommend interning with you, <laughs> um, you you might also get into legal hot water. Um, it's, it's also the, the more substantive work you have someone do as an internship, uh, the more likely they are to stick around. And, uh, and that's great, because then you have someone who's like just a full-on, you know, unpaid contributor all the time, like after the summer is over. So if you give someone substantive work to do, then they're going to become invested in your project. We won't talk a little bit more about investment. Um, you want to prepare for their arrival. So like when they get there, it's like, oh, I don't even know where you're going to sit. Or if it's like, an, you know, if they're interning for you remotely, like, oh, you know, you want to have credentials ready for them to post blogs or whatever it is you're going to have them to, you know, have them do. You don't want to start out on the footing of like, oh, man, it's kind of a pain in the ass to have you here, even though I know in the long run it's going to be better. You know, so just like all of that, like, oh, shoot, I gotta, like, how do I set up a new email address? Like, do it before they get there. Um, I think a clear is, is not is going to give people a good sense of, like, what they're expected to do. And, and sort of, it'll help them have ownership over their area. If you're like, all right, so part of your internship is going to be to blog once a week. And then they, they know. And they're like, none of your internship is to pick up Dave's dry cleaning, that lazy jerk. And then they can tell Dave, like, mm-mm, I'm not picking up dry cleaning. I was told I don't have to. Um, so, you know, and that's, I don't even know if anyone in this room ever gets anything dry cleaned. I never do, but, you know, that's, that's, that's like kind of the quintessential intern example. I'm sure you can fill in the blank with something else menial that you would prefer someone else did for you, but, you know, anyway. 
Um, this is a great example, the, uh, the GNUM Outreach Program for Women. Um, you can see the language, like they've, uh, they've said support software freedom, not like uh, do grunt work. Um, you know, they've, uh, they've specifically named the stuff that they're interested in having folks do. They have said it uh, could be programming, but it could also be design, documentation, marketing. So they've like named exactly the tasks that they think would be helpful. And then you can see like they're, they're talking about collaborating, they're talking about community, they make it clear that it's open to everyone. So the language here is, is good. Is it too small to read? Oh, yeah, this is in last few years. Actually, Molly did a graph, so they've been doing this for about three and a half years. They do two cycles of it. So, um, so this is a newer project uh, that works on getting, um, yeah, Gnome Lake also, they had this realization uh, a few, just a few years ago, like we should formalize that thing where we want folks to help us with non-coding tasks. And I think they've done a pretty good job. And you can see this is the percentage of uh, projects that were non-code projects. So, um, and people have been pretty excited about uh, their their results with that. So you could you could either try and get in on the GNOME OPW, or you could try and clone it and do something else, like maybe rolling with your own project. So you you figured out where to get them. You figured out how to make sure that you're ready for them to arrive. How do you keep them? Right. So. That's, I, I promised you getting them and keeping them. Uh, so it's no good, you know, like one of the things about interns, everyone's like, oh yeah, volunteers are great. And it's like, if they only come down and do like four hours of work and it took you three hours to set it up for them, like, eh, not so great. So you want to keep them around long enough for it to be worth your while. It won't always, a couple of them will, will fall by the wayside, but the, the goal is to get as many of them across the finish line as possible, right? So keeping them, making them comfortable. This is like the obligatory cat slide. There might be one more. But um, making sure that they feel comfortable when, uh, when they come to your project. So that's like, we talked about like not scrambling around to remember like where they're, you know, how you set up a new email. Um, giving them like access to the documentation that they need. Um, you know, introducing them around to the rest of the team. Like, uh, with you know in, in a thoughtful way you know like you know this is Tom or this is Sarah they're gonna be helping us with the with the website this summer um, you know as opposed to like uh, somehow we got this free person who's gonna sit here you know so you can see like one is one is sounds nice and one doesn't sound so nice um, not that I ex expect anyone in here would do the, the former I mean the latter there um, Checking your lines of communication. If everything in your project is communicated on IRC and it's a developer channel and you don't have your marketing folks or your blog posters or your documenters or your translators on your IRC channel, and then like you, then you end up with a situation where like everyone gets up at once and goes to the bar across the street like at the end of the day and like and your your non coders just sitting around like, what happened? It's like one of those sci fi movies where like the you know, they flipped the switch and they all went out. But what happened was someone said in IRC, like, is it time for beer yet? Yeah, okay. Uh, but so if you're gonna if you're gonna do that stuff, or maybe it's something more important than beer after work, um, then move it to a mailing list or get your non-coder to sign up for IRC and hang out in the channel. So one or the other, like you, you can't have like uh, like a project-wide communication that doesn't include your non-coders. Um, making sure that you're saying things the way that you are intending to say them. One thing like I, I found when I got to like the software world, everything's an acronym and no one ever like unpacks it. And so, uh, so you hear stuff and you're like, yeah, that kind of like, well, and so uh, what I did and, and don't make people do this. This is kind of silly. Um, what I did was I wrote down all the acronyms I heard and then I looked them up on Wikipedia at the end of the day because um, no one was explaining them and I didn't want to be like, I don't know what TCP is. So, what? Oh, to do the acronyms or to look them up? Yeah, yeah. Well, this would be like an in-person meeting. I'm just saying if you use, use the same kind of thing that you would use in writing, which is like if you write an article, the first time you say it out and then you're like, 
you know, it's also called TCP, and, and then you can go on and use the acronym, but like just kind of a little bit of, uh, you know, wherewithal there. To, to, no reason for it to sound secretive. Um, giving people autonomy, no one likes to be micromanaged. Uh, Non-coders are no exception in this regard. Um, that means also like kind of letting them tell you how long a task is gonna take. Um, so I, I don't know if anyone here has done any event planning. Uh, it seems like what happens is everyone shows up on Friday and the hotel just happens to be ready. But if you're doing the event planning, that's, that's not how it works out at all. Um, but there are a lot of other tasks in that, in that way. Fundraising is also one where it's like, oh, don't you just send people the email telling them it's time to send the money? <laughs> oh, I wish. I wish that was the case. It's not that way. Um, so letting people kind of tell you how long stuff is going to take and not being like, well, you should be able to get that done sooner. It sounds, sounds easy. Like, mm. Um, setting parameters, like if you're, if you're having someone help you set up a hack fest, that would be like telling them our budget for pizza is $500. So go ahead and I don't care what you put on the pizza, but make sure you don't spend more than 500. Or we always try and do it somewhere near public transportation because we know people don't like to drive. Or whatever the parameters are, and then, then you don't have to micro because you've given the person the actual, the parts that matter. Like there should be pizza, you should be able to get there on the subway. Maybe that's not the case down here. I don't. I guess you don't have a subway. But um, and having uh, making sure that everyone is working towards the same goal. Um, when people have to prioritize two or three different tasks, if they don't know what the big goal is, they're never going to make the right prioritization. So if you have someone working towards the same goal that you're working for, they know what's important to you. Then they know what's important for them to get done. Um, this is, this is what happens when you show up with the wrong thing for the goal. So you don't, you don't want to do that. Um, my friend Claire likes to say this. Teamwork makes the dream work. It sounds, it sounds corny, but it's also like once you've heard it, like you can't unhear it because it rhymes. So um, I don't know if you have that kind of earworm thing. But uh, it, it really does. Like it makes like when people feel like they're, uh, you know, part of the team. Where's that? They're just happier. Like they want, they want to stay. Like they're not like, oop, five o'clock, I'm done. If they feel like they're part of the team, they'll they'll stay until the task is done. Um, if they feel like you know that what they're doing relates to the overall goal in a way that they understand, then then they know like you can't get to that deadline if I don't finish this today. So you you really want to make sure that people feel invested and part of the team because then they're going to give you their best work. Which, you know, see, when you, once you say it, you're like, yeah, that does make sense. It's so, a lot of these I say, just so, you, you know, next time you're like, what would, you know, you can think of whoever your, your mentor or model is, like, what would so-and-so do? And they would, they would make the teamwork choice. Has anyone seen Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross? The movie? Okay. It's a, it's like a movie about these guys that do sales, and so they, their, their mantra is always be closing, which is basically like always be selling. Um, it's kind of like if you ever thought like a sales job would be super fun, you should watch this movie. It's, it's really depressing. Um, but, but I want you to have a mantra, and this is more positive. I, I promise the result will be better than Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Always be including. So if you, if you kind of, if you get into a situation where you're like, she didn't cover that, I don't really know what to do. Like, kind of think to yourself, well, what would, be, what would be the inclusive path, the inclusive choice? Um, and so, and, and, I, and I think that's going to be your best choice, you know, unless you're giving everyone cars. And I don't know why you're giving everyone cars, but, you, you know, it, that's expensive. Um, we like to reward people um, and give them, like, nice titles. Has anyone here been an intern? Did you, did you put the word intern on your resume? No. I, I never would either. It's, it's like, it doesn't, it's, it's like we understood so little about what, we, what you did for us this summer that we could only come up with the title intern to describe it, which is not like an awesome thing to put on your resume, especially if it's an unpaid internship. Like the least you can let someone do is choose like QA associate or something like that to put on the resume. Like, or, you know, uh, summer blogging resident, whatever. But like, so let people have a title. It costs you nothing to let people choose a snazzy title that sounds better than intern uh, or, or vague volunteer. You know, so like vendor coordinator. 
Like, oh, did they set up all the vendor tables for the, for the Linux Fest? Like, awesome, they're the vendor coordinator. So, uh, so titles are great, recognition is great. Um, at Media Goblin every month, uh, or every time we have a release, uh, we thank everyone who contributed and we include all the folks who did non-coding activities right in there. It costs us nothing to do that, but everyone feels excited and they want to keep helping us with translation and documentation and fundraising. So it's just, it costs us nothing to thank them right alongside everybody else, um, but it, it makes a huge difference in the way that people feel about contributing to your project. Um, we talk about recognition. And then um, when people are talking to you, you want to be paying attention and taking notes. So, if, you know, you want to be checking in with your volunteers, like not micromanaging like every single day, but like, oh, hey, you've been, you've been working on this for like a week or so, like how's it going? And then actually, you know, be listening and taking notes and trying to figure out how to make it better. Um, I think attention is one of those things that's reciprocal. Like if you pay attention to people who are contributing to your project, then they will pay attention to you. No one likes to be like on the one-sided part of that equation, especially if they're helping you as a volunteer. Like, that's no good. Um, I also think that the, the listening can be sort of habit forming. Like when you start like an exchange back and forth with someone who's working on a certain aspect, then you get to figure out like which parts each of you is interested in hearing about. And so then you can like have a higher efficiency sort of exchange where instead of it's like, well, on Monday I got coffee, but then we were out, so I had to go buy more filters and no, 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 you know. But like if you just cut to the chase and be like, if someone doesn't order more coffee, it's gonna be a mess in here. Like, okay, great, do it. And then they'll tell you like, oh, so when's the next release date for our software, like, so I can get the blogging thing together? Like, okay, it's gonna be like June 27th. So then you have this short, but like high bandwidth communication that is just better than like, you know, the, the glass of oil you there. Um, not listening, super bad. Um, I, had, uh, I had a job a number of years ago where I was like, here, use this Paradox database. This is like a nonprofit, and they hadn't updated this thing in like forever, and it was an MS-DOS-based database. And um, what you did was you did a bunch of data entry, and then, um, and then as a batch, like after you were done doing the day's data entry, you pushed that batch up, like kind of as a patch to the database. And what it was doing, it was like kind of like, you could almost hear it like, like kind of timing out, and then, uh, and then it would be like, oh, the patch didn't go up. Like, do you want to try again? And I'm like, yeah, sure. I just spent like an hour typing this menial crap. Yes, please try again. So it would try again and then I, you know, and sometimes it would take like four or five times before it would go in. And I just, I was like, wow. You know, so I, t I told my boss, I'm like, the database, it's like, it's really slow. And like, sometimes you have to push the, you know, the days batch up like five times, it just doesn't seem right. And he's like, oh, sure, I'm sure it's fine. Turned out um, we were basing our financials off this database. And what was happening on those five pushes of the patch was it was pushing somewhere between like 10 and 90% of the data up over and over and over again. So we had like, sometimes five or 12 versions of the same record. So like someone would send us a $50 check and it was sending over to the financials like 1,200 bucks, woo! So, um, so the not listening, cause I eventually saw, I was like, I guess I'm just complaining about the cranky old database. So I'll stop talking about it. And like, oh, you wanna see things come out of the woodwork when you're like $12,000 off on your financials? Don't do that. Um, so you do not want to be known for not listening. That is a bad, bad, bad place to be. You're going to be the last person in the building as it burns around you. Um, and then also, everyone is an expert at something. Uh, we talked about like letting people set the time frame for their own thing, but also like if if someone is doing something, you're like, I don't know why you would do it that way. Like ask as opposed to grasp like the way you would do it on there. You know, that's, it's, again, that's one of those things that's like, once you hear it out loud, you're like, oh yeah, that, I would, that would sound, that'd sound kind of clueless if I did that, but, but it happens. Um, you know, if you, if you don't respect people's expertise, then you're gonna get your you know what handed to you. So, um, you, you don't want that. Uh, this one, I don't know, if, like, so people are aware of like kind of the general idea of a pedestal, right? 
Uh, there was a story in Model View Culture uh, a couple weeks ago, maybe a couple months ago now, but um, it was a woman who was working with um, a bunch of coders, a bunch of like young men at a super exciting startup, and um, and they felt like, oh, they're like the most important people in the building um, because this woman usually gets lunch for them and stuff, and she had to go do a funding meeting in the middle of that like one day. And um, like all of these kind of like startups, they have like a ton of snacks in the kitchen. And so like lunch rolls around and they're like, Lisa didn't get us lunch today. And so they went into the kitchen and like the only snack that there was a lot of was this like giant case of beef jerky. So they just plowed through the whole box of beef jerky. And she came in and she's like, oh, I don't, what? Oh my God, you guys, like, how do you not know how to order your own lunch? So like the pedestal is bad for everyone. Like for one, like they're just like, why do you not act like our mommy all the time? Which is creepy and bizarre on its own right. But then like, it's kind of like, do you, can you see yourself? Like you just ate like two pounds of beef jerky for lunch because you couldn't figure out how to get the internet, the thing that makes money for you to bring lunch to you. I don't, I don't understand what happened. So, you know, so the pedestal is kind of a weird thing. Like, I, you know, people should do their own laundry and, and, and know how to order takeout on their own and stuff. And it just creates a really weird artificial dynamic. Um, also, I can't even, I, every time I tell that story, I imagine what the smell of 12 people that have just eaten beef jerky and nothing else for lunch is, and I'm like, ugh. All right, move on. Um, so don't get rid of the pedestal because of sadness. Although, um, you know, pose to unnecessary sadness, but because there are other fishes in the sea, and, and by fishes, sometimes I mean goblins. Like, if you, if you treat your non-coders crummy, then um, we'll take them over at Media Goblin, or some other project will, Gnome will, you know, any number of other projects that um, is doing stuff and is excited and thanks their, uh, oops, sorry, oh, there we go. Um, that thanks to their, you know, that thanks to their translators and thanks to their fundraisers and thanks to their event planners and thanks to their people who sweat all day in the mascot, all of those things, uh, we will take them over at our project or another project. Uh, so just to recap, and I think we're we're doing okay on time. Um, everyone's an expert at something. Let them be that expert in their area. It saves you time. It saves them irritation. Um, listening. This is the other obligatory cat. Um, listening is good. You do not want to be known for not doing it. Um, bonus points for finding out what motivates people to work on your project because um, then you'll know uh, then you'll know if they're getting what, what they were hoping to get out of it. I had someone ask me once, it was a slightly different type of topic, and he's like, why do people leave your project? And it was like a little bit sad, so I was, I was like, well, you, you know, did you, did you talk to them? And they're like, nope. And I'm like, so that might be part one. And then part two is the only person who knows why that person was at your project in the first place is that person. So the only way to find out why they left is to talk with them. So, um, so if you know what is motivating people, you know they're looking to put something on their resume or they want to put a website in their portfolio, then you, know, then you know how to give them what they want so that they can do a bunch of free work for you, right? So. Um, don't treat people like monkeys. Uh, also, maybe lock up the beef jerky. Um, or they will leave. Uh, picture credits. I'm going to take some questions next uh, in a minute here. Just to remind you, the monochromatic, while it works for a while, uh, is just not as good as having all the plants. We're going to, I want you guys to help me build like a big, diverse, multi perspectival uh, free software movement with radishes and beets and lettuce and all those things. Thanks very much. Do people have questions? Yeah? So what projects do you know that actually need non-coders? We'll take you at Media Goblin. Um, but uh, yeah, tons of them. So the, uh, do you want are to, you, are you offering your services? Sure. What do you, what do you want to do? What do you like so doing? I, Yeah. Real job right now. Mm -hmm. so I've done testing before for that. Yeah. So um, we'd love to have you at Media Goblin. I know they're looking for folks to do that at LibreOffice. Uh, I know Gnome is always interested in having people do that. Um, 
Yeah, oh, your what's your and the oh and the Wikimedia Foundation? Yeah. So uh, yeah, you're 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 a very hot commodity. Everyone wants you to come work for them. Awesome. Cool. Oh, did you want to put your two cents in? So yeah, Zen Project, Wikimedia Foundation, apparently. Um, do you have another project or another question? No, question. Is there such a thing as a clearinghouse for projects that need not go to volunteers? Because the, the yeah. way that I typically found clearinghouse and not having anything to do with Right. So that's a yeah. So is there a clearinghouse for uh, non-coding volunteers? Um, in theory, we uh, we would be willing to host that at um, at Open Hatch, which is a nonprofit that works on um, helping new folks find a free software project to contribute to. Um, but in practice, most projects don't send us that many non-coding tickets, unfortunately. Um, so for non-coders who are currently looking for something, I would look at uh, the projects that have participated in the GNOME uh, outreach program because uh, they have done that first step of figuring out and then articulating what types of non-coding tasks they could use. Um, so that's, that's where I would start today, but I would advocate if you're on the other end and your project is not like constantly blogging, um, you should be blogging anyway, but uh, every time we uh, every time we blog uh, a new release at Media Goblin, like I said, we thank all the people who are doing the non-coding tasks. And then most of the times when we blog any other kind of news, we remind people like, if you want to get involved as a coder, a documenter, a translator, or, you know, blah 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 blah, like please come and see us on email or IRC. You know, so we give them both options if because uh, not all non-coders hang out on IRC all day. So that's that's like a, a little homework for uh, for the folks who have code projects in the room, I guess. Other questions, comments, ideas, pitches. I think uh, you had that great big list of things that are you know, that are not Yeah. Feature. I, I, I didn't get a chance to read it all. Oh, so we can go back up if you but, want. Uh, Certainly, you just go to the beginning. It was like the third slide. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know, and I have like 70 or something. Whoops, there we go. Oh, yeah. Blogging, um, petitions, if you're doing like kind of advocacy of style work, um, you know, uh, answering questions for like support, anything, any of those, if you think your project could use more of it, um, then the first step is to articulate it and put it on your website. The, the big thing that I get. Is it which one? Feature. Feature. Oh, feature uh, like, ideas. Yeah. Like, I need this thing. User, user feedback is fantastic. We, um, we did an event in Boston called SpinachCon where we had people come. It was like, what if your favorite free software project has a little spinach in its teeth? So we invited users to come and tell us, like, in a nice way, like, you know, constructive way, like, what was not working for them. And, uh, you know, and I would encourage anyone else to run a spinach con for their project if they want to find that stuff out. Um, you know, so uh, all of those things, like helping helping users um, do stuff, moderating lists and forums, which uh, like has pretty high burnout factor depending on your list or forum, uh, is a great place to use non-coders. So there's there's tons and tons to do. So, anything else? I have a. I have one other. One of the things I do as a non-coder, in, in addition to chatting with folks about um, patents, is uh, oh, is I help with a, a conference in Seattle too. So, so since we have time, I'll plug that as well. Um, so, okay. Anything else? Everyone's ready to go get non-coders in their project? Yeah. Worst 
visualizers in the world when it comes to putting together what a t shirt should look like, what a website should look like. You know, all these sorts of things mm -hmm. that most most geeks are really deficient at, and yet you've got these incredibly creative talents floating around out there saying, What do I do? What do I do? And it's like, please come make, make us look good for once. <laughs> you know, we 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 we've got good code, but make us look good so that someone actually says, Hey, what what is that? Use your words. <laughs> you know, yeah. You know, it, it's uh, you know that that's one bridge that I, I rarely see, and most of the time it's Somebody's, somebody's girlfriend's sister's brother-in-law does that, so they brought them in and they did logos or something. Mm -hmm. but, but I don't see the sort of dynamic interchange between like a, a graphics community and a, an open source coding community that I would really hope. Yeah, and I think it's really good. Like, and I'd love to see stuff marketed a little bit, like, uh, or like you know, kind of tested, like. Um, and I don't, I don't mean to pick on Gluster because it's a, it's a great project, but their, um, their logo is kind of funny. It looks like a bug eating the code because it's like a bug eating a leaf with the zeros and ones on it. And, and, and I said that to um, John Mark, I think, last year, and I, I was like, what, what does Gluster do? It looks like a bug eating your code. <laughs> and he's like, uh, I never thought of it like that. And I was like, huh, yeah, that's a funny one then. But it, I mean, it's meant to be like everyone, like like the ants, everyone is bringing a little piece together. And I was like, okay, I, I guess I can see the metaphor flip the other way. It's, it's, it's carrying the code, not eating it, but the ants carry with their mouth in, in real life and then also in the Gluster logo. So, um, hmm? This, this um, I, I've got sort of a rare Well, and sometimes you can ask a project where you're like, I really loved your t-shirts. Who did the design? You might be able to, um, with beer or, or cash, like coax that person to design a t-shirt or two for you. In this case, it's uh, one of the organizing committee's uh, uh, guys. Uh, his dad does graphic design. And so he, he did the, the seagull for us. So, so graphic design, yeah. Writing, blogging is also like, um, Chris and I at uh, Media Goblin, like he'll he'll write like all of the things that are in the new release as like a sort of a spew of words, and then I will make them into sentences. So, and he's aware of that. I mean, like I mean, I don't think he would ever publish the spew, but he knows that I'll make it into a good sentence. So, yeah. okay, well, cool. If folks don't have anything else, um, you know, feel free. Maybe you had like a question you don't ask in front of the group. You can shoot me an email. Um, Otherwise, uh, go forth, find non-coders. Awesome. Thank you. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes.
The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.